Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the York English Language Toolkit annual uh, CPD workshop for English language teachers, teachers of English language A level. This is our fifth annual CPD workshop, but it's the first one we've hosted in this online format. So apologies if we fluff our lines a little bit at the beginning, we're a bit daunted by broadcasting to the nation in this way. We're definitely disappointed not to be able to meet all of you in person because when we do our workshops in York, that's one of the best bits is, is um, getting to have an exchange of knowledge where we learn from you as much as uh, we uh, pass on the things that we know about from linguistics. But we're really excited, on the other hand, that so many of you are able to be involved because we're using this online format um, and from all over the UK. We hope that you'll contribute by posting your questions for the presenters during the webinar using that Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. And if you're on Twitter, you can post your comments and reactions as we go along using the hashtag YorkCPD2020. So a possible advantage of uh, the online format is that we're not going to be interrupted by squirrels uh, this year as we were last year by this cheeky chap who stole an apple off the buffet and ran away with it. But it's possible that we might get some technical gremlins uh, creeping in because we've got presenters zooming in from home from six different locations. Um, so please bear with us if, if that happens. If you have any technical issues your end, don't worry, we are recording the whole uh, webinar and there'll be edited highlights of that on the website afterwards. And you won't miss out completely. Um, so the programme looks as this, we're going to take the first sort of 45 minutes to work through some talks from the four case studies. We'll take a, a very short break in the middle, just in case anyone needs to run to the loo. And then we'll pick up with the Q&A and uh, Dan's talk. And of course, at any point, if you want to ask a question, use this Q&A button down here. The workshop features four case studies, all related to the linguistics of the English language, and they're based on the latest research from our own department here in York. And each time you're hearing from the authors of the research. So they are really the experts um, and make sure you put all your questions to them that you want to. The pre-workshop materials on the website will have given you a pre-workshop talk and links to a big stack of classroom materials that you can download from the website and adapt for your own use later and we encourage you to take a really good look through those later if you haven't had time before today. Everyone who's here in the webinar who signed in through that zoom link will receive a certificate of attendance that we'll send to that address that you signed up with there and then also be a post workshop quiz so you can see if your score has improved see if you now have a better answer than Barry Manilow for the author of that quote there's a prize for whoever put that one in. And we also will be really grateful for your feedback on the workshop and materials. And in particular, we'd really like to hear your stories of how you've used the materials. But for now, we're gonna get straight down to business and I'm gonna ask Claire Childs to take over the screen. Claire is a lecturer in English language and linguistics in our department. She teaches social linguistics and researches grammatical change in English dialects. And I think she's now ready to present. And her study is a study of grammatical change in the use of never in British English dialects. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Sam. And hi, everybody. So um, I'm going to talk to you about use of never and uh, grammatical change, as Sam says. And in doing so, I'm going to pick up on a few themes from the A-level syllabus, syllabus, in particular, language diversity and language change in relation to grammar and semantics and pragmatics. I'm going to start by reviewing a few key background um, things to know, which you might have seen already in the pre-workshop uh, talk, but um, if you haven't viewed that, that's fine. Um, you'll be kept up to speed. So first of all, there's three main types of never, and the first one is perhaps the one you might Think of first, if you ask, what, what do you mean by the word never? Um, it means not ever or not on any occasion. So this is the one in the left-hand side, type one. And this refers to possible events over a period of time. So an example would be if Speaker A says, didn't your school used to organise a sixth form party every year? Um, speaker B says, yes, but I never organised it. So here, Speaker B is uh, meaning that any time there was a sixth form party, they didn't organise it. And this is uh, originally from Old English, but of course we still use it today. 
And then there's type two, which is called window of opportunity never. This uh, means not rather than not ever. Um, and it refers to a single instant event that we can call an achievement that could have taken place within a particular window of opportunity, but didn't. And crucially, you're expecting um, the event to only happen just one time. Um, so for instance, I waited in for the postman, but he never arrived is an example of that. And this is found uh, in the 17th century and again, is still used uh, today. Then uh, the last kind, type three, is a generic negator um, that also means not, but rather than type two just being restricted to achievements, the generic negator type three can occur with any kind of state or event, so i.e. any sort of sentence type whatsoever. And this uh, is a non-standard use doesn't have any kind of inherent time reference. So just using a similar example to type one, but in a different context, we can see an example of this kind. So uh, speaker A said, you were in charge of organizing last year's six one party, weren't you? Speaker A says, I never organized it last year. Um, and if they say I never organized it last year, just referring to one single party, that is this kind of non-standard use of never. And this one's found from the mid 19th century onwards, um, but only in particular dialects. So it, in all likelihood, you probably use definitely type one, you might use type two, though some people find it uh, perhaps less common than type one. Type three, um, you might have that as part of your dialect or you might not. And the key thing to take from this is basically that never has undergone diachronic language change, i.e. change over time from meaning not ever to meaning not. So type one developed into type two, and then type two developed into type three, but all three kinds still exist uh, in the language today. So my research was interested in the question, to what extent does variation in the use of never in present day British English dialects reflect this historical development? And I'll give a brief overview of um, this in the next slide. Um, I'm getting some comments that say, can I turn the mic up? I think I'm on as high as I can go. Um, apologies, I'll try and talk a bit louder. I hope it's okay for everybody. Um, so data and methods, um, conversations, there were conversations from three different um, archives from Glasgow, Tyneside and Salford, uh, extracted instances of never and didn't in past tense contexts, both type two and type three. And this is because in this context, never and didn't mean the same thing. So they're equivalent forms in this environment. So I extracted instances of these and categorized them into the different kinds, and then compared the percentage frequency of each form in the type two versus the type three context with the aim of seeing whether that newest use the non-standard kind is still influenced by its origins in the type two. So in the pre-workshop talk, um, I talked about results according to lexical aspect and I've just got a, this green box here and reminding you what those different categories of lexical aspect were. Um, I also discussed results uh, according to dialects separately. Um, so in this slide, I'm gonna show you something different, which is combining the two, because you might be wondering whether the findings are consistent across different dialects of English. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen these categories before, the main distinction I'm gonna focus on is the achievements where an event does not persist over time. So the, the time of the event is seen as instantaneous um, like the verb uh, to hit, for instance. Uh, and what we can see, first of all, in terms of dialect differences, is that there's a much higher frequency of never used as the non-standard kind in Glasgow compared to Salford and Tyneside. Um, this chimes with existing literature that suggests this is particularly common in Scottish varieties. And um, why that's the case is not entirely clear, but it might be because of 
differences in language contact in Scotland or possibly di other differences in the negation system that have been documented. But what we can see also is that in terms of lexical aspect, the non-standard type 3 never is influenced by its origins in the type 2, because remember, type 2 were just achievements only. Type 3 can theoretically occur with any sentence kind, but it's still occurring at the highest frequencies with achievements. And this is consistent across the dialect. So you see the highest percentages for achievements across the board. Um, so we can see here that never's changed from referring to events persisting over time to single instance. And uh, just a methodological point here, when we split data by uh, locality, sometimes it means you end up with less data for certain categories. So that's why achievement, uh, sorry, activities and accomplishments are missing for Glasgow and Salford um, in this graph. But it's not just the semantics that differ between the different kinds of never, but also the pragmatic functions. So we have a number of different functions that it can serve, one of which is contradiction, which is explicit denial of another speaker's assertion. So for instance, we have here an example from Glasgow where the first speaker says, you just done it. Um, and the second speaker says, no, I never. So they're just contradicting what came before. Um, you can also use it to deny um, expectations. So with this example from Salford, the person says, my cousins were supposed to be meeting us at four and they didn't turn up till seven. So the equivalent with never would be never turned up till seven. Um, and then lastly, there's a more neutral context where there's no kind of expectation. Uh, as we see in this example from Glasgow, um, first speaker says, it said in the forecast, speaker two said that I never put a washing out. And that's just brand new information, doesn't really deny an expectation. So the differences between the kinds of never are that type three never is most likely to be used for contradiction, as in the first example. Um, type two never is not used for that function at all. Um, it's used for the other two. And also, um, we get this interesting effect where examples like the first kind with ellipsis of the verb, i.e. no, I never, instead of no, I never did or no, I never did it, often have that contradiction function. So we get this clustering of um, what, as linguists, we would say a very marked construction, a very non-standard um, lack of verb, yeah, uh, ellipsis of the verb, with a non-standard use of never, and a very um, so salient emphatic contradiction function as well. So the take home messages from this are that never has undergone semantic and grammatical change, changing from not ever to not. And we can class this as semantic broadening because it's broadening the, the context of use that it has. Um, it tends to refer to instant achievements um, even as it's changed from type two to type three. And it's developed this contradiction function in interaction as well, which is new. So the, the results um, show us that linguistic restrictions on the use of words and constructions can persist for a very long time, even when their meanings and contexts of use have changed. And also that the standardness or acceptability of grammatical constructions is really very context dependent. And that's one of the themes that we take up in the activities for this case study on the English Language Toolkit website, um, which you can see briefly here. Um, so there's tasks about acceptability, um, categorizing the different kinds of never. Um, but in terms of additional resources, if you have students wanting to do projects on language variation or language change, you might be able to use the questionnaires in the activities and develop those. They, they ask speakers to give acceptability judgments, but you can use any kinds of sentences you like in there. You don't have to just focus on never, of course. Um, you might be able to adapt them to studies of language attitudes as well. And also, if you're interested in um, how people actually use language, you might be able to find recordings online, videos, and calculate the frequency of linguistic features in their speech. And also, if you're interested more um, in the historical aspect of this or any other kinds of grammatical change, 
You might like to look at dictionaries or prescriptive grammars or online resources like the Oxford English Dictionary to see what they say about words and their use and how this has changed over time. And I'll finish there. So thank you very much, everybody. I'll uh, end there. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Claire. Uh, I'm going to ask Paul to start sharing his screen. Paul is a professor in our department, um, focused primarily on research. Our students are lucky that he also teaches on our modules in multimodality in communication and on language as action. And I think he's now ready and raring to go to present his work on the language of courtroom questioning. Thank you, Paul. Good. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can uh, see uh, uh, a, a page called Language in the Workplace on your screen. Um, I take it you can all see that. Um, in my um, pre-workshop talk, I uh, focus very much on questioning in courtroom trials, and particularly the... Uh, sorry, start my video. I didn't realize it was off. Is that good? Yes. Sorry, I'll start again. Uh, in my pre-workshop um, uh, uh, talk, I focus very much on questioning in courtroom trials, uh, looking at how lawyers ask uh, witnesses uh, questions. And I focused especially or highlighted the differences between direct examination on the one hand and cross-examination on the other. Direct examination is where the lawyer and witness are on the same side. So the lawyer is asking uh, benign, friendly questions, questions designed to help the, the witness tell, tell her story. Whilst in cross-examination, uh, the lawyer is trying to undermine the credibility or the evidence that the, um, that the witness is giving. Um, and so it's hostile questioning. Um, and today I want to focus very much on uh, cross-examination, on this hostile questioning. Um, I'm going, there is a, um, a PowerPoint that accompanies this uh, talk. Uh, I'm not going to show you the PowerPoint. It's there available for you. What I'm going to do instead is just take you through one page of a transcript uh, from a tra trial for rape in, uh, held in the, the US uh, a few years ago. Um, to illustrate, I'm going to take, uh, show you f four aspects of questioning here um, that, uh, um, that are particularly prominent. And I'm going to take it from the same page. I'm not going to work through the rest of the transcript, though you have a longer extra, uh, extract available to you. I want to look at just four features. Um, the first is this, that again, in that, in that uh, pre-workshop talk, um, I mentioned that uh, the, the, there's a restricted turn-taking system that what lawyers uh, uh, should do is to ask questions. There are, there are questions and answers. Lawyers ask the questions and witnesses answer them, which gives lawyers a certain kind of power. The questioner has a power uh, to set the agenda. Um, and uh, this means that whatever the lawyer says should be heard as, should be done as a question. Now, that isn't straightforward. That's quite a complex matter because, of course, we know that in, in ordinary conversation, in ordinary interaction, you can ask questions which are not grammatically interrogative. You could say, uh, you're going home tomorrow, uh, with uh, sometimes with a certain kind of intonation, but you're going home tomorrow is, is grammatically uh, a statement. Uh, it's a statement we, we would call it de declarative uh, grammatically. Um, and um, so that you can ask questions in forms which are not interrogative forms. Now, if you look at the uh, line one and two uh, on this uh, transcript, the lawyer says, now, February 14th of, and gives the year, you were down in the, in the city. Is, is that right? Now, the first part of that, now, on February 14th, you were down in the city, is a declarative. It's a statement. And the, is that right, is an add-on. It's, it's like a tag question. Um, is that right? And then again in line four, and you went to a, a bar in the city. Is that correct? So you get statements, in effect, declaratives, followed by a, um, a tag question. Tag questions of that kind put pressure on. They are inviting 
uh, the recipient, the witness, to, to uh, confirm. And that puts pressure on the, on the witness or on a recipient of that kind of question to indeed confirm. So first of all, these are relatively prep already. They are the ways of asking a question, but in such a way as to put pressure on the, on the, uh, on the recipient, on the witness. Additionally, notice that uh, in line 10, in line 13, in line 16, and line 21, these are negative constructions. There was liquor served there, wasn't there? And you had some liquor, didn't you? The negative constructions uh, work in our field of conversation analysis demonstrates that negative interrogatives, negative constructions, are uh, put, putting added pressure on uh, the um, uh, on the one being questioned. This is used a lot in questioning politicians, for example, and in press conferences. And it was one reason why some politicians, and I won't name names, don't care for press conferences very much. Uh, so the first feature is that uh, tag questions and particularly negative constructions, negative interrogatives and tag questions. Here's a second feature. I mentioned in that uh, in that uh, pre-workshop talk that the the uh, the questioner has a particular kind of power, if you like, by virtue of their ability also to they ask a question, they get an answer. In their third turn, they can, in a sense, assess or at least imply an assessment of that uh, of that answer. Now, here in line four, the questioner. Um, uh, the lawyer says, and you, and you went to a bar in the city, is that correct? She answers, it's a club. Now notice that in line eight, he doesn't do a follow-up question or a next question. He does a club, which invites the other one to, to correct themselves. We do this in ordinary talk. Uh, the repeat or partial repeat of what someone's just said is an invitation to self-correct. And so in a way, what it's doing is to, to imply he doesn't believe her, or, or it's it's uh, it's uh, it's skeptical. It's not accepting uh, that um, that answer, and we'll see what happens to that later. So, re repeating or partial repeating uh, by the lawyer is a way of assessing and assessing the credibility of the previous answer. Third feature is this: coming back to this bar and club. You see that when he he asked when you went to a bar. She replaces that. She doesn't say no. She doesn't use a negative, doesn't deny that. But she replaces club with, uh, sorry, bar with club. Now, there are different connotations to those, uh, to those um, categories or words. Uh, look, though, down at line 21 and 22, and you'll, you'll see the lawyer asked, it's where girls and fellows meet, isn't it? And her reply is, again, not no but to replace girls and fellas with people. Now, I hardly need to, to uh, go into the, the connotations of, of these, but, uh, but just brief, very briefly, of course, what she does in People Go There is to, um, as it were, deny the relevance of gender, of the gender in girls and fellas. And bar and club, particularly in American, bar is, uh, uh, of course, we know that bars are more associated with drinking, uh, than uh, clubs. Bar, bar, a club is slightly fancier. Let's say there's membership involved and such like. A bar highlights drinking. This witness has just uh, attested to the fact that she was 18. In this American state, uh, uh, drinking under age, uh, dr drinking uh, at 18 is underage. The drinking, uh, the age limit is 21. So the bar already implies, but without his having to say it, uh, that um, she was drinking underage, but also she is trying to go for a slightly less, one might say, less sleazy kind of environment. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's this, and it brings these things together in a way. He he asked, "You went to a bar." Um, she uh, she replaced that with club. Now he pursues that. He does not allow that to stand. He pursues it in line ten. He asks having invited her to, to correct in line eight, which she didn't in line nine, one second pause, um, the lawyer then says, there was liquor served there, wasn't there? And she agrees to that, yes. You had some liquor, didn't you? Yes. And 3.1 second pause, and then he hits her with, it's a singles club, isn't that what it is? That's to say, the matter of club is, whether it's a bar or a club is irrelevant. The point was, they sell liquor, yes, and you had some. 
It's that kind of a place. So what he uh, does is, is uh, to, in a way, undermine her attempt to, uh, to uh, replace this with a, a club and to imply, in a way, that that's being evasive. Um, and uh, so that, the, the, again, the lawyer has this power to, uh, to control the agenda, to pursue a point, not to, not to just leave it with the witness's claim, but to pursue it and bring, uh, bring certain bits of evidence together in a way that is that is um, impugns, I think, with the uh, the witnesses' uh, testimony. Um, you have uh, I, I've given you th three two more pages of this transcript, and if you're working with us with students, um, uh, what you can do is to uh, is to first of all find the kind of those those four things that I've been talking about. You'll find other instances, many of them in the uh, following two, two pages of transcript, and you could use it as, as a, a kind of teaching aid um, if, you, uh, if you wanted to. Um, uh, I would say also at the end of the PowerPoint, um, uh, the PowerPoint summarizes these points. At the end of that are some notes of guidance on the, um, um, on the uh, lead-in and uh, um, um, other tasks that you are you are uh, given. Uh, my uh, take-home message to finish with is simply that language is essentially strategic, both the language of the lawyer, but also you know, the defensive uh, language of the uh, of witness. Both are involved in strategies to try to either undermine evidence or, in her case, to defend it. That's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Tamar to start staring, sharing her screen. So Tamar is a senior lecturer in our department, as well as one of our admissions tutors, teaching modules on language acquisition and usage based views of language. And I think it looks like you're now ready to present Tamar on infant directed speech. Hello. ברוכים הבאים להרצאה השלישית בוורקשופ בנושא דליית מילים מדיבור שוטף בקרב תינוקות השומעים אנגלית בריטית. Um, I've just spoken to you in fluent Hebrew and presumably some of you uh, identified the word workshop in what I was saying. Um, I'm just putting my <laughs> timer on. Um, but you probably, and, and that shows that you achieved what we call segmentation, which means that you recognize the word in running speech, you recognize where it started and where it ended and you managed to sort of extract it from the speech, even though there were not pauses either before it or after it. And I'm assuming that you could do that to the English word workshop, but you couldn't do it to the Hebrew words uh, in my speech unless you're a speaker of Hebrew. So when you listen to speech, you're not familiar with what you hear is a mush rather than a sequence of independent words. So. I think you will agree with me that um, segmenting speech is a difficult task. Now, interestingly, this task has been claimed, uh, and that's based on published research, it's been claimed that it's easy for babies to do, or for infants. And when I say infants, I mean babies who are not speaking yet, so under the age of one and a half years. And here is a quote from a textbook on language acquisition by Eve Clark, who is a very respected um, scholar. I don't have any problem with what she's saying, but this is how she portrays um, <clears throat> the research on segmentation. So she says, in fact, by seven and a half months, infants listen longer to previously familiarized words. When these are later presented inside longer sentences than to sentences containing unfamiliar control se uh, sequences. Now notice that she is presenting segmentation as something that seven and a half month uh, old infants can do without qualifying this claim by saying they can do so if they are raised in a certain language or in a certain dialect or um, using certain types of words or using certain test conditions. She just assumes that this is a general fact true for most typical babies. Um, and that's the way most of my field treats segmentation. Um, so me and a bunch of my colleagues, we designed a study where we, first of all, wanted to see whether British babies are a little bit delayed in when they reach segmentation than American babies. Both babies groups, both groups of babies are learning English, but they're learning different dialects of English. So we wanted to see if there was a delay and we wanted to see 
if there is a delay by how much, uh, how many months of delay there are. And also, um, we wanted to see if um, we do find such a, such a delay, whether we can explain it by the type of speech style that the babies are hearing in the two societies. Because we knew based on uh, previous research that the American parents tend to use more exaggerated infant directed speech or IDS than um, uh, British parents. So we and colleagues from Plymouth ran 14 different experiments with 14 different groups of babies uh, trying to get the babies to segment at some point with different, we'd made some different method methodological changes between one experiment and the next and discovered that 13 out of the 14 groups could not segment no matter what. Um, there was a single group, the group that shows here is group um, number four in, in bold. They are the only group that managed to segment the stimuli. And I'll, I'll now let you listen to the stimuli that most, so this is uh, the stimuli we used, which by stimuli, I mean the, the speech that the babies heard in the lab. So this is a typical, the typical infant directed speech that most babies in the Plymouth lab heard in their experiments. Oops, I lost my cursor here. There we go. He gave her a carriage clock for Christmas. The carriage was pulled by two big white horses. The gentle footman looked after the carriage well. And when, when they despaired of getting the babies to segment, they asked their speaker to record one last time, but in very, very exaggerated infant directed speech style. And this is the stimuli that she then uh, recorded and which one group of infants, the only group that heard it, managed to segment. He gave her a carriage clock for Christmas. The carriage was pulled by two big white horses. The gentle footman looked after the carriage well. You can notice that this um, speech style, first of all, I think it sounds forced. It sounds artificial. Secondly, it's, uh, you can hear that the pitch is very, very high and it's also slower. And that was the only type of stimuli and the only group that managed to do this, any segmentation out of all these 14 groups. And this group was older than, I mean, it was at the older range. Uh, they were 10 and a half months old. So what do these experiments show us? First of all, we found that British infants do not segment under most conditions. Secondly, neither did the American babies. So we tested one group of American babies at eight months, which is the age at which American babies are supposed to be able to segment, but they didn't segment either. Uh, when we gave the babies one syllable words, which are also supposed to be easier to segment than two syllable words, no, those weren't segmented either. So the question is, are British babies seriously delayed in segmentation? But the answer I think is probably not. And what we've learned here is not something interesting about British babies versus American babies, but we've learned something about the segmentation task. And that is that this task is probably more fragile than is usually assumed. When I say that it is fragile, what I mean by that is that you need a very sort of magical, happy combination for it to work, uh, meaning for the babies to be able to perform it successfully. So they need to be old enough, you need to have let them listen to the speech for long enough, and you need the speech to be recorded in a particular speech, speech style. And if you don't, if, if even one of these things is missing, you won't maybe, uh, see segmentation happening. And that shows us something quite important that skills and knowledge aren't all or none necessarily, but some they can be quite elusive and sometimes they can show themselves to be existent uh, under some conditions or in some contexts, but seem not to exist in other conditions or in other contexts. Um, and I also want to point out that the successful group here heard a kind of speech style in the lab that they will probably never hear outside of the lab. So the fact that they succeeded probably doesn't depend on this group being more advanced in any way. So it doesn't really tell us anything about diff important differences between infants. What it tells us is something about um, testing conditions or met methods used by labs. Now, because the only group that succeeded in segmentation was the group that 
received very exaggerated speech stimuli. The question is, should British adults begin to talk to infants differently in a more exaggerated speech style? And uh, my answer is definitely not. Um, the successful group of infants probably heard at home the same style or styles of speech that every other group heard. So there's no evidence to see, to think, to make us think that this group came from a different kind of background speech style to the other groups. Um, and what we did by using the exaggerated um, infant directed speech in the lab is to make the task in the lab, the lab task easier because we gave them speech that was so pronounced and so slow. But it hasn't changed what segmentation would feel like for them when they are outside of the lab in the real world, in real conditions. And there, speech is probably less extreme. There are fewer repetitions. There is background noise. So segmentation is actually much, much more difficult. And what we have done by manipulating the speech style in the lab is to end up creating a test that tests a, a skill that doesn't reflect what infants encounter in real life anymore. It doesn't, it's very detached from the things we actually want to uh, research when we research babies, which is what happens to them in their real life rather than when they come to the lab. So finally, if there are differences between the speech styles that parents use in the UK and the US, are they important for language development? So I just want to remind you that the, the reason we wanted to look at the differences in speech style to babies was that we thought we needed to explain a difference in segmentation achievement between British and American babies. But it doesn't look anymore like we have any evidence to believe that there is a difference in segmentation abilities between the babies growing up in these two societies. So I don't think we need to explain any. <laughs> there is no difference to explain by looking at the speech style differences. Now, even if there are speech, line, speech style differences, and there might very well be because the literature says there are such, we don't know that they make any difference for infant learning, really. And what we did find when we um, conducted this study, and those of you who've looked at the extension task would have noticed it, is that speech styles to infants differ actually very much uh, within dialects and within speakers, not only between dialects. So I think that's a really interesting point, and the, probably the important questions for future studies are, first of all, to use naturalistic speech rather than this artificial speech, and then within the range of styles in naturalistic speech to see whether infants respond to these styles differently, and do they learn more from one type of speech style than from the other. Thank you very much. That's the end. I will unshare my screen now. Wonderful. Thanks very much, um, Tamar. Um, and I'm going to ask Dom now to share his screen so that he's set up and ready to go. Dom is a senior lecturer in our department. He's also one of our admissions tutors and he teaches modules in social linguistics and phonetics, including language and identity and forensic linguistics. And I think he's now ready to present on accent bias in Britain. Thanks, Dom. Thanks, Sam. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk for the, the last of these sessions um, about language attitudes. And if you've had a chance to look at some of the materials on the website, you may have come across remarks of this kind. This is one that was taken from a, an essay written by a former student in linguistics. Um, have a look at that. It's not untypical of the sorts of things that we hear day to day. These views are very commonly expressed. They're, they're absolutely uh, you know, unremarkable, uh, at least in the, the British context. So this person's saying RP is, is more suitable um, for certain sorts of occupations that, than others. This person thinks that uh, brain surgeons shouldn't be speaking with a Geordie accent. That seems to be the thrust of this. So I'm sure we've all um, been exposed to this kind of thing a lot in the past. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people out there who think that this kind of remark is perfectly okay, is perfectly legitimate. Um, being tied up as it is with um, ideas of rightness and wrongness in language and quality, good and bad quality uh, and so forth. And also one, um, one thing that keeps coming through in discussions on this topic is the idea that speakers can change their accents if they want to, uh, much as we would change our clothes or our hairstyle, that kind of thing. Um, and given those notions that are out there floating around, 
we think that um, there's a real risk of the sorts of biases that we can observe out there in the world turning into actual discrimination. It's where those um, biases are actually enacted and potentially in the workplace that could lead to all sorts of unfairness. Um, there's not much research on this and in fact this is why we, uh, this is what inspired our project that I'm going to talk about in the remainder of the session also um, in the, the pre-workshop talk I, I go into this material in a bit more detail and then there's some, some of this material is uh, all, also in there. So the project in question is called Accent Bias Britain ABB and we teamed up with some colleagues at Queen Mary University of London um, on that project funded by the SRC. Okay, now, so what did we do? We recorded actors um, speaking aloud some good versus bad answers. What do I mean by that? We actually had these drafted by professional lawyers um, who were not academic lawyers. They, they were actually involved in the recruitment uh, process in their own organizations. So they were worded in a very authentic way. And when I say good and bad, I don't mean that there were actually any bad answers. There, there were good ones and there were sort of extra good ones. We wanted to keep the, the level of realism high um, by coming up with answers that could plausibly have been given by an interview uh, candidate in a commercial law firm. So the idea was that these people were interviewing for a position as a trainee solicitor in a big law firm and um, these were uh, selected on grounds of realism. I've got some example recordings which I'll play you just some short snippets of. Brexit may not have a major effect on British law firms though of course it's too soon to tell what the effects will be. Some Europeans move back to their home country. Okay so that's one example of uh, one of the accents that we chose. Here's another. Brexit may not have a major effect on British law firms, though of course it's too soon to tell what the effects will be. Some Euro Okay, and so on. And so we had um, a, a fair few of these, as I'll show you on the next slide, we had some uh, five different accents of English. We made sure that the wording was consistent from uh, each script um, to another. So uh, the idea was that all we were varying was the, the speaker's accent, not the, not the wording that they used. So it's a form of matched guys design. Um, if you want to go onto the ABB website, you'll find out a lot more detail about this. So those are the, the five accents we tested, and we had two speakers of each, two male speakers of each. Um, we wanted to ensure that when people gave responses, they were responding to the accent rather than the specific speaker. So we thought we'd better have a, a couple of speakers of each. There they are. We have RP, Received Pronunciation, Estuary English, MLE, Multicultural London English, General Northern English, and so-called urban West Yorkshire English, so that's from Leeds. So by choosing these five accents, we could look at multiple dimensions simultaneously. We had the standard, non-standard dimension. We had region, north versus south of England, and we had um, ethnicity, um, specifically in, in the case of MLE. Um, now, the listeners that we recruited were asked to rate both the answers and the speakers themselves the perceived qualities of the speakers as well as the answers and we used these uh, evaluation scales where one is low 10 is high uh, we're interested in the quality of the answer overall how much expert knowledge was shown by that answer would the candidate succeed as a lawyer in the opinion of the listener would that person like to work with the candidate and then a kind of overall uh, rating score and i'm going to show you first um some data that we collected by way of kind of grounding this, giving this a context relative to other surveys that had been done. So actually what we did initially was just ask people, respondents, uh, around a thousand of those, to give their subjective responses to just the names for accents. We didn't get them to listen to anything at this point. We just got them to uh, look at a list of accents and say how they perceive those in terms of their um, prestige and also their pleasantness, their attractiveness to listen to. So what we're looking at here, okay, we've got the accent rating from low to high on the vertical axis, and then different accents of English represented there. This is actually a subset of the, the accents that were, were tested. We've got three different uh, surveys here. We've got one from the late 1960s. We've got uh, another one from the 2000s, and then our, our most recent data from uh, just a few months ago. 
shown in blue. And what you can see there is that we've got RP over there on the left, ranked highest for prestige and pleasantness. Birmingham on the far right, um, as usual, comes out bottom of the pile, and then various other accents listed in between. Uh, what you'll see there is that the blue line for, for our 2019 data, the, the curve is, or the slope is actually flatter, which means that there isn't as big a difference between the most highly rated accent RP and the lowest rated one. So there's, you know, they're more balanced in terms of people's perceptions of them. But overall, the, the slope is the same. Okay, so not much has changed in the last half century, it would seem. I'll now move on to talk about the results that came out of getting our participants actually to listen to the samples. Okay, so once again, we've got the uh, mean evaluation there on the vertical axis and then our five different accents um, from the ABB project listed at the bottom. You can see the RP comes out over all the top, uh, top rated accent there. Now I should say this, the, the, the listeners here were non-lawyers. These were people who didn't have a background in law and there was about 800 of them, okay? Um, they grouped the two uh, sorry, the, the two Northern English accents, so General Northern and Urban West Yorkshire, in more or less the same way. They weren't rated as high as RP, but they were considered about the same as each other. Um, this is when we'd collapsed those various criteria together. We found that they were so highly correlated that it wasn't worth treating them as separate criteria. So we rolled them all into one score that we're calling um, higher ability. Okay. So the two Northern English accents treated about the same. And then the two non-standard Southern accents, Estuary English, Multicultural London English, again, more or less on a par with each other, but uh, rated the lowest. Now, I should say, if you look at the numbers on the, the y-axis, the vertical scale there, you see that the range of scores is actually really small. So there isn't much in it here. It seems that those quite stark differences that we saw in the previous uh, chart, the one where we asked people to, to label the, the to, to rate the labels, um, there's actually a much narrower uh, difference between the, the accents in question. And then finally, these are the results for the, the lawyers. So these are people with expertise in, uh, in law, with legal training experience, many of them, of um, actually doing job interviews for, for candidates. And what we can see here is that um, the, the good quality answers, the, the very good ones uh, that we, we scripted, are rated higher than the, the less good ones, which are shown in green there. Um, but what you'll notice is that the, the chart is quite flat. There's actually very little difference across the five accents there. Um, and finally, if we look at those two boxes on the left, you can see that RP overall performs the, the least well here. It's, it's rated lowest by our, our expert listeners, which is kind of interesting. That, that, flew in the face to some extent of what we had expected to see. So it looks like um, here with these expert listeners, uh, they're to some extent suppressing the accent bias that we might have expected them to show and which you know other data would certainly suggest is out there in the world. Um, they're focusing more on the expertise, so the content of those answers rather than the form. But this effect for RP is kind of interesting because it's as though they're setting the bar a bit higher for RP speakers. They expect better of them than they do for the speakers of the non-standard varieties. It just shows you that attitudes are quite a complex thing and they're not always positive in the way that you would expect. The last thing I want to mention is the um, testing of some interventions that we, we made use of. We, did, we ran a set of additional experiments where we tested some um, interventions to try and uh, see which would be the most effective in terms of asking people to apply a bit of cognitive control over their subjective responses to these uh, accents and um, samples. Um, we started off with the uh, in the understanding that stereotypical reactions to accents are perfectly normal. Everybody has them. You know, their bias is is quite a normal feature of of human life. Um, it's trying to break the link between uh, bias and actual discrimination, you know, enacting that, that kind of um, set of preferences. So we tested five different strategies here, as you can see, raising awareness, identifying irrelevant information, committing to fairness and objectivity, increasing accountability, and appealing to multiculturalism. And of the five, it was the first of those, raising awareness that seemed to 
um, give the most bang for the buck. If you want to know more about this, go onto the ABB website. You can read about this in, in a lot more detail. So just to wrap up then, it seems that, you know, taking this long view over the last half century, we can see that accent bias does seem to have quite a, a, a persistent uh, presence in, in life in, in the UK. Um, the hierarchy hasn't changed, the, you know, with this preference for RP and then the, the non-standard ones at the far end of the scale. We're seeing, um, if you look at some of the materials we've provided in the uh, additional materials, the lead-in, the extension materials, you'll see that um, there seems to be a kind of an age effect whereby younger people seem to have more positive attitudes towards non-standard English. But in the context of that, that long view that we're taking, the 50-year time span, it seems that um, we're kind of stuck in this cycle whereby younger people's attitudes tend to become more conservative as they grow older, um, less tolerant, so to speak. There's also a sensitivity to context at play here. And when you get people actually to listen to speech, actual people talking, rather than just saying, what do you think about Cockney? What do you think about the Queen's English? That kind of thing. You get much more um, uh, equivalents, much more nuanced answers, really, than, than when you, uh, you get them just to look at labels on a page. And finally, um, clearly, accent bias is still with us. There's still great potential for that to lead to discrimination. Um, but what's encouraging is that the, the lawyers that we tested showed that where it really counts, people can actually suppress those biases and put them to one side. Nonetheless, we think that um, making effective interventions, sharing that with the community in human resources departments in law firms is absolutely critical. And that's me. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Dom. Um, I'm going to start with a question that was sent in for uh, for Claire, one that's been upvoted uh, during the talk. Um, the question is from Rebecca Watson. Thanks, Rebecca. In the pre-reading, Claire, there seemed to be a difference in the use of never in the three different places. Um, and to what extent is that uh, evidence of regional variation or synchronic change rather than diachronic change? Yeah, um, I mean, with with this, the, there's always a regional element as well. So you're absolutely right. Um, the this use of never, this non-standard one in particular, is it's been called a vernacular universal of English. It's found in Englishes around the world. Um, it, you know, it, it, you know, loads of countries, loads of different varieties of English have it. Um, but what seems to be different is the frequency with which it's used. So the Scottish uh, community in my study had it particularly at high frequencies, but also some of the context of use differ. So like that elliptical example, no, I never, um, when it's like that contradiction function, that that was very sort of characteristic of some of the Glasgow examples in particular in my study. So it seems that the reason for that might be that um, some of the historical change in the use of never has progressed sort of further in some dialects than others um, through various sort of systems. We see these sort of cycles of change, especially with negation where, um, you know, forms can get this emphatic function and then lose it over time. So that might be the next step where never, um, you know, seems emphatic now, but it'll gradually become sort of, it could potentially become the new not, like it might not seem so non-standard in, you know, hundreds of years time. Great. And a related question that came in from the pre-workshop, um, which was about the grammatical change in never. It, it seems like the old usage is the one that's the standard usage, whereas the newest one, the type three, is the non-standard. And so the question is, is that is that the pattern? Is it always the case that older usages tend to be the ones that are more accepted as the standard? I think I think it depends. I think you get a lot of cases like that where you get new uses coming in and people notice them and they're noticeably non-standard and people comment on it. Um, but also you get the opposite where things that used to be or be be part of standard English year you know, centuries ago are, are, are now seen as you know non-standard so for instance like double uh, double negation or negative concord like i didn't see nobody um that was the sort of default 
way of expressing. I didn't see anybody in uh, Middle English, but nowadays that's seen as non-standard, even though it's a bit like the never, it's used in loads of Englishes around the world, but it's not part of standard English. Okay, I'm going to rush on now to Paul. Um, Paul, a question that has uh, that came in before the uh, webinar as well um, from Adele Mitchell. Thanks, Adele, for sending that in. Um, Paul, do you see any of the questioning methods that you mentioned uh, in your analysis in the way that Keir Starmer speaks in PMQs? Um, Adele was thinking of the way he drills down through the evidence and uses his legal background. This is an interesting question, and it gives me an opportunity um, to distinguish the A brief one. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll make it brief. Uh, to distinguish the difference between uh, the individual, a category of the individual, and the context in which they're speaking. I haven't actually seen much of what uh, of, uh, of uh, question time, but um, of Prime Minister's question time. But Starmer is a, a trained lawyer, so his questions are forensic, as we know, um, but he's not speaking in a trial, in a court of law. It's rather like you as teachers, you're, you're teachers, but you don't go home or talk to your friends in quite the same. Now, we know that there are teacherly ways, but you don't go home and, and uh, um, have conversations which consist of you, you asking questions in the way that you would do of students. Similarly, Starmer is not doing it quite in, the, in, a, in a court of law, so it's a different context, even though his uh, forensic abilities are, uh, are the result of his legal training. So the point is, there's a difference between the, the person and the context. And we're looking at the use of language in a context. And par a parliamentary, although it, it shares some re uh, resemblance, you know, questions and answers and so forth, um, uh, it's, it's not the same as a, a trial. Um, a related question, is, is language strategic in all occupations or is it specific to the, the legal setting? I was interested in that. It is, of course, it can be strategic in many settings. But it's, but it's strategic in different ways um, and, and not, quite as, um, not quite as every question is as strategic. Let me give you an example. Just before the excerpt that I showed you, uh, the lawyer asked the, um, the witness, uh, uh, and on you know, such and such a date, uh, you were 18, is that right? Um, that's say he asks a question, uh, he asks for her age. Now, I've seen that question asked in health visitors, and I'm working mostly on medical interaction. Uh, health visitors will ask uh, a, 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 um, a parent, a, a mother, and then the father uh, for their age. That is not strategic, but of course it was in, in the context of that trial for rape because he was implying and, and setting up the matter up. So questions are not necessarily innocent. And I have done comparative work on questioning in ordinary conversation and in, uh, uh, and in trials and indeed in medical. Uh, and there are, let's say there are different strategies. That's great. Thank you, Paul. Can I've I got... take a moment? Oh, no, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm going to, there might be time at the end, we'll never know. I've got a question for Tamar. Um, how do researchers know that pre-verbal babies have managed to segment? What's the evidence and how do you know a baby has recognised a word? So in these types of studies, or in, in order to know what babies can um, recognise, what we do is we play things we expect them to recognize and things that we don't. So something that they have heard before that should be familiar to them and something that they haven't heard before. We play them several times from different directions, sometimes, one, sometimes from the left, sometimes from the, from the right. And we measure how long they listen to each uh, thing that we play for them. And by they, when they stop being interested in something, they look away from the source of sound. So they are looking towards the source of sound and we measure how long they look. And we, we either find that they look more towards the thing that is known to them because they are engaged in it and interest in, interested in it, or sometimes we find that they're more interested in things that they don't know. So they show what is called a no novelty preference, and they look or listen more to the things that are new to them. But as long as there is a difference between the two, we know that they, we, we conclude that they have uh, recognized the word. And if enough of them do it, then we are pretty confident that the whole group as a group can recognize the words. That's great. Thanks, Tamar. Um, 
Okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna have one question for Dom, I think, and then we might have to pass on to Dan. Um, there's a question that's come in about perceptions of estuary English, so that EE code in your set. Um, in, in one of the A-level textbooks, it's uh, described that this is speakers aiming for a classless profile to avoid the unfriendly connotations of RP. Um, and uh, this teacher, I haven't got your name, sorry, um, had used an example in class about with George Osborne picking up ESG English and using it. So your research shows that ESG English isn't that actually that well regarded. How would you, are, are perceptions of ESG English perhaps in decline? I think um, you, you have to consider the, the context in which the ESG English samples are being heard. Um, there are, as we know, the, these associations between certain sorts of English and elite professions like law and high finance and uh, medicine and so on. Um, so in that context, you know, you could argue that um, the, the bar is being set very high and anybody who's got anything non-standard about, about their speech might be um, considered, you know, less than, than optimal, shall we say. Um, on the other hand, under certain circumstances, having what sounds like an estuary English pronunciation may well be seen as a good thing, and, and that, that could uh, lie behind the adoption of, you know, estuary sounding features by people like George Osborne. Um, you know, how, the extent to which that's a, a conscious decision on his part, we, we don't know, but um, it, it lends, the, the argument goes, because it sits between, you know, RP at one end and then, you know, a kind of working class um, Thames, Thames estuary, uh, Cockney-like variety uh, at the other, it sits somewhere in the middle, so it's considered more approachable, more warmer, more friendly, um, you know, a little bit more... Um, less intimidating those sorts of qualities so very very heavily dependent on context so as with so many things context 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 great okay we may have a little bit more time for questions at the end but for now i'm going to close that off there uh, at least temporarily and i'm going to ask dan clayton to uh set uh, to share the screen and uh, we'll, as the panel, we'll turn our video off in a moment. Um, Dan probably needs uh, no introduction uh, to an audience of English language teachers and we're really grateful to you, Dan, for um, bringing your Liverpool flag um, and um, contributing to the workshop today. You've taken part in, in uh, many of them um, before. Um, Dan's got extensive experience of teaching English language at A-level and as an AQA examiner, writing textbooks, contributing to the EMC magazine and uh, the Engling, Englang blog, and most recently as a podcaster with the New Lexis podcast. So Dan's going to um, share with us now uh, and with all of us how you can take the research that we've uh, shared with you and put that into practice. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Sam. And thanks very much for inviting me again. It's, it's a Leeds United flag. We're going to be champions of the championship, as uh, Liverpool are already champions of the Premiership. Anyway, um, so looking at how we might put this into practice, I think this, this gets easier every year for me, um, because I think as, as this goes on from 2015 was the first one, I think 2019 we, we did this together and now the 2020 session, um, the resources become even more sort of finely tuned to what we do at A-level. And, you know, that's, that's great credit to the linguists at University of York who are doing it, but also uh, to Heather and Jill, who've put together some of the material as well today. Um, and, you know, have got a very clear idea about how it all fits together with, with the A-level spec. Um, so I think one of the things that's, that's interesting about all of this as well is that if you were to look at some of the um, material uh, pre, the pre-workshop material, and I'm sure many of you have, but there's, there's probably quite a few who haven't seen all of it as well. There's a real wealth of material there that's, that's fantastic for the um, A-level. Um, and it fits really closely with what we really wanted to do. So when we were revising the specifications for English language A-level, particularly the, the AQA one that I'm involved with, we really wanted to try and refresh the content to bring it up to date, to look at the most recent research and to encourage students and teachers to try and keep abreast of developments in linguistics and language study. So 
Um, the material from 2015 and 2019, which Jill Lavender's done a really good index for, um, can talk you through some of those things. And a few of those things, such as um, discussions about Jafakan, as it's been termed, or multicultural London English, as Don was saying, is the is more sort of accepted term for it. Um, you know, those, those sort of debates have been really prominent. There's some great stuff there. Um, lots of students have, have talked about that kind of material in, in the, um, you know, the exams and their own uh, language investigations and the like. Um, what we also see are some interesting things around um, the ways in which uh, people talk about sort of online identity as well. Um, there's been lots of work that students have done the last couple of years on accent and social attitudes. Um, more recently as well, I, last year, Carmen Yamas uh, spoke um, at the, this CPD session and in this year, February 2020, she spoke to 700 A-level students in London about the work that she and Don Watt have been doing on judgments about accents. Um, Carmen and Dom have also written for e-magazine, so the February edition of that this year. Catherine Lang, who spoke last year, is also speaking in September at our e-mag e-conference, um, looking at child language development. So there's already been, you know, lots, lots of stuff disseminated um, through other routes as well. And there's, there's bound to be more that will come out of today as well. Um, in various other formats, I'm sure. Um, but have a look at the website, have a look through some of the, the pre-conference material and you'll find a wealth of really, really good stuff. So what I'm gonna do quickly is just sort of talk through a few of the things that I think are really relevant from today's four sessions. Um, I'll try to link them in to the AQA spec. Um, if you don't do AQA, I know there are a few people who, who aren't doing AQA or, or here today. Um, they, they do link to other areas of, of things like OCR and Edexcel and Educas. Um, I've, not, I've not kind of specified those, but you, I'm sure you'd be able to see where those fit in. And more broadly, I think one of the things I really wanted to kind of point out was that, you know, what, what we really want to do with the A-level, as well as, you know, obviously the, the aim of getting students good grades and, you know, enjoying the course and, and finding interesting things about language along the way, is to really help them to develop as linguists. Um, we want them to be sensitive to context and meanings of language. Um, we want them to really think very carefully about the role of language in different situations and for different purposes. And we want them as well to think about what's gone before. You know, they, they, we want them to look at linguistic research, think about studies that can inform their own work, um, and really feed into the kind of work they're doing on the A-level with you. And I think there's a really important thing that I've been sort of banging on about for ages with, with A-level English language, is that I think it's really important that when there's such a dearth of genuine language study on the GCSE for English, that we really want to get students to understand that language is worthy of study. And, you know, there are some really great courses that students can do as well, you know, from the A-level, they could go on to do lots of interesting courses in, in linguistics and language study. Um, but we want them to kind of think a little bit about what language is as well. And I think there is a bit of a tendency when students are younger to think that language is just words. Maybe, you know, a bit more with the focus on grammar as well, that language is just sentences. But I think what we really want them to do at A-level is to realise that, you know, as we can see from the work from these sessions, is that language is also about sounds, it's about strategies, it's about patterns, and it's about the social meanings that language can convey, as well as the sort of literal meanings too. So, um, one of the things that I think is important here to think about is uh, with Claire's session, um, session one um, that, that Claire um, put together was um, some really interesting stuff about language diversity and change, uh, language discourses it crosses into as well, and it also helps with the language investigation. So the discussion of what we mean by standard is really important. Um, going beyond a simple kind of right wrong binary is a really important area I think for us to explore on the course and that idea of the, the standard changing over time and how that change isn't necessarily uh, regular or even in geographical spread um, but is something that we, we see occurring in a range of different ways. Um, I think there's also some clear overlap we can see as well between change and diversity and that links to, through to um, Dom's thing in session four as well. And I think as well, what we can see with Claire's session is that there's also some really interesting stuff there about the nature of change. You know, one change leads to another. You might link that to things like the great vowel shift, or if you've looked at um, American English, the northern city shift. Um, Lane Green has talked about this in, in various things that he's written as well, observations about smaller changes in language um, being part of a wider kind of balanced system that adapts. 
Um, there's also some really interesting stuff that Claire put forward as well that helps with project design for NEA language investigations. You know, we can, I'm sure we can look back at much of her stuff and think, you know, what kind of lessons could be learned from you know, some of the methodology presented there? So some ideas there from Claire's session. Um, Paul Drew's one as well was very interesting in terms of thinking about how we could link that to language and occupation. Also, I think really practical benefits for how we might approach this in the language investigation as well. I think the role of pragmatics is key there. Speech as action in certain contexts is a you know, major part of what he was talking about. But I think it's really, really important as well to see that st students understand very early on that you know, language is more than just words. It can also be about the sort of implications of words. It can be about strategies that are employed when we choose our words and think about the sort of wider approaches we want to take. The role of context, as he was pointing out in the Q&A as well, the, the, the huge importance of context. We could say one thing in different contexts and it would mean very, very different things. And also the sort of idea of strategy. This is something I think, you know, particularly on the AQA course, we've talked about trying to encourage students to uh, think about the ways in which they can look at patterns of language and strategies, strategic uses of questions can be um, one of the ways to, to approach that. So things like the predetermined nature of Q&A structure in courtroom interactions. But as well, I think, you know, some really interesting uses of examples that, that Paul offered. Um, and that's kind of a really good sort of model for students to follow. That sense that if you're looking at a wider strategy, you can always pin it back down to individual examples of language. So, for example, in the pre-conference material, the use of conjunctions to support the interpretation of cooperative questioning taking part, uh, taking place when there is direct questioning going on. And, you know, in contrast, some of the more aggressive questioning techniques used in cross-examination. Um, and a few things that could be linked to uh, the NEA. Um, TV interviews with politicians, job interviews, all of those kind of things that he talked about could, could be applied to transcripts of those. And it's a really great model of what students can do for language investigations. Thinking about context and interpretation of meanings in these very specific contexts, dealing with quite manageable data sets, um, offering clear contrastive focus, particularly in the pre-conference material, there's some great stuff looking at cross-examination versus direct questioning. Um, and that focus on strategies and patterns alongside the detailed EGs um, from, you know, from those transcripts. Another kind of thing that we could look at as well, um, and this connects with um, what we've got in um, Tamar's presentation is child language development. And again, it's really helpful. I saw a question pop up earlier on about this. Um, references to, up-to-date references to child-directed, infant-directed speech. I mean, many of the textbooks have go back as um, far as 1994, I think, and there's references to Papua New Guinea and Samoa. Um, but it's interesting to see that there's maybe more kind of universal features of child-directed speech, infant-directed speech. And also variation across the world and even within English speakers, you know, there's and the same individuals in, in different situations. I think it's also really important for showing the role that sound plays in, in language. Sounds are something to be studied and interpreted. Um, and I think as well, you know, more widely, um, it shows uh, the importance of doing background reading for students before a language investigation and as a way of setting up a hypothesis um, or research question to be explored. And in, then in session four, um, Don Watt presented some really interesting stuff about accent bias. The accent bias in Britain website is fantastic. Some really, really great material there that can be used straight away with students. And I think it's really, really important that we, we show this to, to students, particularly when we're thinking about our higher attaining students and what they can do um, to think about the overlap between change and diversity. Again, with something with AQA that we've really tried to encourage in recent years um, is to get students at the very top end to realize that change and diversity overlap and that you know, sometimes uh, diversity leads change, sometimes it changes a result of diversity. It's very interesting to see that in relation to accent bias and the whole way in which we might approach things around things like age grading and apparent time uh, studies, offering some sort of insight into that. And I think as well, this sort of notion of language discourse is, is, is crucial to this too. Um, I think in, in some of the pre-conference material, there's a reference to attitudes to accents being more about attitudes to people and the users of language. And those kind of discourses we have about good English versus bad, right v wrong, 
correct versus incorrect. All of that is, is really important for getting to grips, um, getting students to get to grips with those kind of notions of language discourses, plus those kind of wider social and real world attitudes. And they can see that the sort of real effects of those, you know, biases leading to discrimination, accent prejudices leading to unfair treatment, and how interventions can be staged around accent um, attitudes um, to really kind of head some of those off. It's also interesting, I think, as well, to think from sort of methodological standpoints about the perceptions of the accent labels versus the attitudes to real accents themselves. And as Dom said, you know, pe people may respond in one way to a label like estuary English and they immediately bring to mind a sort of social stereotype. Whereas when you actually hear, hear somebody speaking in estuary English, you may have very different attitudes towards it. So an interesting sort of methodological issue um, for NEA work there, I think. And I think it's also interesting, of course, to think a little bit about the way in which um, students might uh, track changing attitudes and the contexts to those. Um, and you know, some of the changing attitudes to things like RP and estuary English uh, through some of the things that we see in popular culture, perhaps. So just to conclude and to sort of round it off, there's masses of material, as I'm sure you'll have seen, that feeds directly into the course, particularly if you go back and have a look at the uh, pre-conference, pre-workshop material. Um, Jill's put together a great index that will help you make sense of a lot of last year's and 2015's material. And just once again, thanks very much for, for doing all of this. It's so good to have this kind of material available um, for teachers of, of English language A-level. So thanks once again for, for doing this and for, uh, for sharing your expertise with us all. I'll, I'll stop my uh, sharing of the screen there. Hand Thanks back. very much, Dan. Um, really excellent. And for us, it's really rewarding to see that we are uh, roughly on the tri right track. And indeed, that as we've interacted with teachers in the last uh, five workshops, we've um, gained a better understanding. So we're going to take uh, just um, a few questions for, for Dan. We've got about four or five minutes to do that. Um, I've got one very general one, and then there may be uh, time for another one after that. Um, this is coming from Tanya from Scarborough. Hi, Tanya. Um, Dan, there's not much on language and sexuality in the textbooks. Um, and Tanya has a couple of students doing res research on this for NEAs. Um, can you suggest anywhere where they can access research or theory, or is there any linguistic linguists that have published on this? And you could also you could throw this to the panel if you um, want to after. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, there's certainly some work that Paul Baker's done on that, um, and I, I think. Um, Interesting. To, I think he's got a new book out called um, Fantabulosa, I think, looking at Polari. Yeah. Um, and I think also if you, if one, of, one of the books that I keep going back to for, for this is Sext Texts, which is one of the ones he did a little while ago. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting area. And I, 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 there's an increasing number of students want to do language investigations on this, particularly around uh, trans identities. Um, we've had lots of really interesting investigations on things like, you know, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race as well um, and you know it's going beyond sort of binary notions of you know male and female speech I mean they're, they're the ones that spring to mind um, I don't know if anyone else on the on the panel has got other suggestions. Anyone want to chip in? Yeah there, there's a quite a big literature on um, the speech of um, yep, gay men, um, trans people uh, re really quite a, a large and expanding um, set of, of research papers on that topic. I'm, I'm coming at it from the phonetics end, so I'm interested in um, the features of, of voice and speech principally. But um, work by people like Benjamin Munson, for example, he's very well known in the field. Uh, some of it's quite technical, That's you know, so a word of warning about that is some of it's quite, it requires a fairly high level of knowledge about uh, speech articulation and so on, but um, I, I've been teaching students about that for some time now and, um, you know, there's, the research is ongoing at a really a furious pace, it's, it's, there's plenty to read, put it that way, and, and Paul Baker's work is great, you know, that's, I would, I would second what, what Dan said about uh, the accessibility of that work, it's really good. I mean, that might be an idea for um, getting together a some sort of student and teacher friendly resource um if we could sort of mm -hmm. 
pool some knowledge about that would be great yep I know of one investigation, but I don't think it's been written up yet, looking at infant-directed speech in Israel, comparing uh, gay female parents to gay male parents and how they speak to their children. But I think it's still, if it exists, I will dig it up and f share it, but I don't know if it does yet. My right. collaborator on the ABB project, Erez Levon, one of his other many talents is... Uh, looking at the speech of um, gay men in Israel. Actually, he's, he's done some um, ethnographic fieldwork over there. So that's worth digging into as well, you know, from the more kind of interactional um, sociolinguistics point of view. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. And again, this is a general one. So I'll put this to you, Dan, um, but you can throw it open if you want to. So. Um, this came in before the workshop. The, the recent Black Lives Matter protests and related discussions of racism have really engaged students and their reflections on language. Um, do you have any thoughts or ideas for how students could respond to these issues and perhaps follow up in their investigations? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. And it's, it, it's, um, it's certainly something we've picked up, you know, interest from, from students in this. And... I think that's great. And I, th I think it's, it's really important as well that linguists have responded to it in the way they have. It's very encouraging to see, um, you know, linguistic Twitter, um, you know, really engaging and challenging themselves, questioning themselves about it. I think some really, some, some of the things that sort of struck, struck me as things to, to look at would be, you know, thinking about um, the use of kind of racialized language um, to represent um, different ethnic groups if you like in in for example say sports commentary sports reporting and uh, some really interesting work being done by people like kelly wright um in the us i think at michigan university um and i think as well um you know looking at looking at some of the, the work um around around that there was a recent report i think that was done by i think a danish um Danish company in, in association with the Professional Footballers Association about representation of, of black and white footballers. So something like that with a representation focus would be really interesting. But also having a look at how the actual demonstrations, how the, um, you know, the protests themselves have been covered, I think is, is fascinating because obviously some sort of critical discourse approach might, might lend itself to you know, approaching this. Um, where you could have a look at the ways in which different agendas are advanced in, you know, publications, newspapers, online sources, um, and really sort of dig into some of the sort of ideologies and, and ways in which, um, you know, we're, we're being manipulated and language is being used in, in various different ways to, to present different viewpoints. And I think that that's that's brilliant stuff for the for the course. I think it's a you know that's great for for students to investigate. Um, they're just a couple of things, and um, you know they're, they're ones that spring to mind. I don't know what other other people would be um, would suggest. I think that's probably all we've got time for. But um, we can um, we will put our collective brains together and see if we can um, pull up some resources and, and put these things either either announce them through our Twitter feed or we'll put them on the website. Um, there's been loads of questions that we haven't been able to ask live, but we will post those with answers on the website um, afterwards. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again briefly, if I may, um, so that you can... I'll just talk you through the last uh, few thing, points I want to make. So all of the materials that we have been talking about today are going to be on the website and they're going to stay there. They're not for, it's not time limited. They'll be up there um, indefinitely. Um, we'll be adding to them. So this is on the screen here is still um, just an example of um, the, the, the slides that... Um, go with Dom's talk. These are the classroom materials that you can download and uh, adapt if you want to. Um, some next steps would be to go to the website and use the index that Jill has helped us prepare um, to find your way through all the other materials from previous workshops um, and, and explore all of the other case studies. And if there's things you want to suggest that we add, add words to our glossary or extend things then we're open to suggestions all the time if this has whet your appetite to do uh, get your teeth into more linguistics we've got a free uh, MOOC massive online open course starting um, on Monday 
um, on accents, attitudes, and identity. And that you, it's it's free uh, for six weeks from whatever date you start. So you could start on Monday, but you don't have to start on Monday. You can choose um, a time when you've got time to work through it. And that's aimed at students as well as teachers. Um, and we'll post some more information about that on our Twitter feed if you want to know more. But that's completely free. And that also isn't time limited. That's going to be available. And Claire has been masterminding most of the work on that. It features um, Dom's work, Carmen's work, Claire's work, all kinds of people's work, Paul Kurzweil's work. Um, as well as a general introduction to the theories. Um, one of the things we'd really like you to do is let us know how you use these materials, because it sounds like they're going to be really useful for you. And it's really valuable for us if you could tell us the stories of how you use them. Just send us an email or, or however. Um, there's a, a feedback form on, on the website. Um, and as, as a little... Um, taster for the day when you we're all longing to be back in our classrooms uh, if you send us your stories we've got a set of classroom posters to post out to you uh, that you can put up in your classroom to say thanks for your stories having those stories helps us um, get the funding which means that we can go on doing more workshops so it's all uh, good karma and goes around um, so today's workshop would not have been possible without lots of hard work by uh, all of the people you can see on the screen now I'd like to particularly flag up Heather here who you haven't seen but um, all of these classroom materials that you've been looking at were designed by her um, and somebody needs to hire her very very soon um, we'd love to hear what our materials get up to once they're back out in the real world and being used and um, we I'm determined to try and end on time I think we're doing all right on that so um, I will wrap up there the recording of today will be available edited highlights on the website again indefinitely um, from as soon as we can get it out there uh, next week so thanks again to all our presenters particularly Dan as our guest um, and to Jill uh, for chipping in and thanks to all of you for coming we hope to see you live and in the flesh sometime in York but maybe again for another online event because I think this has been a really great experience for us we hope it has been for you thanks again bye-bye <laughs>